Okay, good morning. Um, I'm excited for this panel. It's um, seven great economists, and um, it's just amazing to be part of this, and, and I think we're going to learn a lot. We have two hours, which sounds like a lot, but I think once we get through just even a couple of questions, we'll realize that we wish we had a lot more. So here's the basic structure of how I wanted to organize it. I'm going to start with introductions uh, very quickly. And then um, since uh, David and Catherine have just spoken, I'm going to let the other panelists have uh, opening remarks uh, up to 10 minutes each. And then once we go down the line, we'll come back to David and Catherine to see if they have any reactions to what were said. And then we'll open it up into a, a sort of free-flowing discussion of the panel for the remaining time that we have. We will also take questions from the audience, but um, I believe it needs to be written down and then it will be sort of fed through the panel sort of on a flowing basis. So that's how we're going to handle audience questions. Um, so without much ado, let me get started with introductions. Obviously, um, David and Catherine were introduced earlier. Mark Reisman is joining us, who is a professor of economics at Boston University. Katya Zaim is an associate professor of business economics and public policy at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School. Joseph Farrell is a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Michael Salinger is the Jacqueline and Arthur Barr, Professor of Management and Professor of Economics at Boston University, Quay Strom School of Business, and finally, Howard Shalansky, Professor of Law at the Georgetown University Law Center and partner in Davis Polk's litigation department. Um, so let me, we're gonna go in that order in which we did the introduction, so let's go ahead and start with Mark. All right, thanks so much, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so I, I'm so sorry I came in a little late. I did get to see David's slides, so I do feel like I can reply to the slides, even though I had my adventure at the airport, which uh, kept me from seeing most of his talk. Um, so, um, you know, a big part of the slides is about definitions. I'll just kind of offer my own perspective on, on definitions, focusing on the part that I disagree with them rather than the parts <laughs> that I agree with them. Um, and then maybe try and turn the conversation more to antitrust issues, which I see as kind of the part of the goal of our, our panel. Um, so on definitions, you know, two areas where I just want to kind of add or differentiate myself from what they said is, you know, one, um, you know, I always see two-sidedness as a, is on a continuum, as you always have to ask how important is two-sidedness in the market? There's a sense in which every market is two-sided. You know, I feel like I study networks for a living and I can see networks everywhere and I see platform issues everywhere. I can always come up with one and, and uh, I'm going to say I'm a little bit sympathetic to Catherine's uh, misguided student who uh, thinks Coca-Cola bottle caps are a platform. Um, I bet, you know, we can come up with a story here in this room where, where it does, it is a legitimate platform. And, and then the question isn't really, you know, is a firm a platform or not, but how important is platformness in, in, in studying the outcomes of the firm? You know, Ford, you could argue as a platform between its dealers and its consumers and the way it sets up its franchising agreements, but maybe we can ignore the platform nature of Ford when we um, you know, ask many, most questions we ask about Ford Motor Company. And those charts, I think, you know, where we sort of label which of the top 10 firms are platform firms or not platform firms, they often get us in these kind of really awful discussions where we're trying to pin down, you know, is a firm a platform or not. And the other one I would say is that, you know, we have to recognize, and this kind of really builds off of um, Catherine's point of McCoring, that the choice to be a platform is an endogenous choice. That is, you know, I think in the perfect world, we'd be talking about two-sided strategies, not two-sided markets. That is, firms choose, you know, whether to be a platform, and they can choose to internalize one side of the, of the two-sided market and become a reseller. And there's some great research by Aju and Wright kind of making that really explicit, but we see, you know, Amazon sells books in sort of a one-sided way, but is a marketplace for something else. And, you know, Microsoft is a three-sided network of hardware and software and consumers for its, for its operating system, but produces all the hardware itself for uh, video games. And that choice is, a, you know, a very purposeful choice by the firm. They get to make that choice, and I think that should be really important in how we think about um, two-sidedness and, and, and going forward. So just offering maybe the, some thoughts on, on antitrust. Um, you know, I think um, understanding market power is, is really challenging in these contexts. Um, I feel like the, the question I, I always think of is, um, you know, if a firm has, you know, high margins and maybe restrictive contracts on one side of the market but is competing it all away on the other side of the market and has zero profits, does it have market power? 
And I find this question actually really challenging even after all, all this time. Um, you know, if, a, if we went to a firm and said, oh, you have high margins and you have restricted contracts, and the firm said, well, I have to spend all my profits lobbying the government to maintain my monopoly position, we, we probably wouldn't find that a very compelling uh, antitrust defense. Or, you know, maybe more, maybe better for society if they said we spend it all, you know, innovating or getting patents or something like that. Uh, it, still, you know, we would, we would think a firm like that could at least, in theory, act anti-competitively on the other side. And differentiating the two-sided platform from those cases, I think, is, is really crucial to our, to our project. And, you know, at some level, the difference is this interrelatedness of pricing. That is, you know, if you think of an entry cost into a market, you know, as being lobbying the government, getting a patent, or getting consumers that you can go then get the, go to the profitable side of the market, only in the two-sided case is the pricing so central. That is, the pricing on one side of the market is so closely related to the pricing on the other side of the market. And to me, it's that interrelatedness of pricing that really changes the direction of the, the antitrust conversation. So I'll stop there. I think we're going to keep hearing about these issues. But um, okay. Um, well, thank you very much for having me and including me on this panel. Um, I wanted to t build a little bit on what um, David and Catherine said and just speak about two areas that I think are the the source of the current interest maybe in multi-sided platforms. One is actually exactly what Mark just talked about, <laughs> namely how do we actually think about defining uh, market power in such settings and whether a firm might be as a platform uh, exercising market powers in, in ways that we think are anti-competitive. And the pricing strategies that uh, David uh, outlined, I think highlight that quite nicely, where in a one-sided market you might not be uh, you might be concerned with above uh, supranormal profit margins, but in a two-sided platform, that isn't necessarily the case. And that seems uh, crucial in situations where uh, networks are, are very prevalent and network effects are, are high, but separating that uh, in practice seems quite challenging, especially to the extent that we think firms have the ability to choose on a spectrum how important network effects are to their, to their business. Um, the second reason why I think uh, there's been an increasing attention on platform markets is uh, whether you like the classification of a firm <laughs> into a, a network market or not, is just the rise of uh, digital platforms and the role that they play in, in uh, uh, economic interactions today. Um, and that then relates to areas around scale. Um, as both David and Catherine spoke to, we would expect network markets to be conducive to larger firms because that creates value to the consumer that the firm on either side then might try to, to exploit, but also raises um, then maybe more traditional questions uh, in, in anti-competitive effects of scale. And, um, you know, Catherine's, I think, take on that uh, uh, was that typically network effects are relatively concentrated. And so as a result, these kinds of scale effects are maybe not as prevalent. Um, and I think sort of assessing that uh, and how it interacts with this entry seems key. At the same time, it also does strike me that platforms do have the ability to generate value to the sites that they're serving that may make entry more difficult. So for example, if you think about Amazon, Amazon uh, is sort of a platform in the traditional sense in that it serves about 70% uh, of uh, its sales from the marketplace, uh, but also has its own in-house sales. And I think the, the place where Amazon has been quite successful in uh, carving out a competitive position for itself is in building up entry barriers by investing in distribution at the same time as investing in the size of the platform. And so these physical investments interact quite nicely with network effects to, to create value to both sides of the market that I think a smaller competitor is going to have a harder time uh, replicating. Um, and then lastly, I would also just say one unique feature of uh, digital platforms uh, compared to some of these traditional ones maybe is that uh, these are settings where oftentimes the platform itself has an activity going on on one side uh, of the market. 
And so you might think about uh, you know, Google and Google Maps, where the, the platform might be um, the search engine in the middle, um, and it is also active in, in related uh, markets. Or similarly, you might think about the platform as having better access to information about how the two sides of the market function and how it might be able to, to exploit that in, in driving its own activity on one or the other side of the, the market. And so I think those are difficult issues to, to think through, especially in terms of uh, competition, uh, competition implications. But I think in part it's this multi-product nature of these new digital platforms that has attracted a lot of attention recently. <clears throat> One of the problems with being at an event and on a panel with so many distinguished people is um, everything you have to say gets preempted, uh, at least if it's right. Um, I'm in trouble here. Howard is going to be really in trouble. Um, so I wanted to start by asking, uh, network effects has been a, a popular uh, and successful brand name for quite a number of years. Um, is this just kind of a rediscovery of, of network effects? And I think it sort of is and sort of isn't. Uh, when we talked back in the 80s about indirect network effects, I think it's fair to say that most of the time we were asking the following question. Look at one side of the, what we would now call a two-sided market, Imagine the relationship between the two sides being perhaps opti optimally managed or managed however it gets managed. Uh, do you then have economies of scale or density on the side you're focusing on? And the, uh, the new platform literature, the newer platform literature, uh, asks about the same situation but focuses more on what is this management of the relationship between the two sides? How do you do it? Um, and um, how do you price it is a particularly important question. So I think it's, it's somewhat a, um, a rediscussion of network effects, but, uh, but does have a different focus. Um, so I had a handful of, of points to make. Let me try to get through them all, or many of them. Um, one is, and I think uh, somebody mentioned this earlier this morning, uh, I think when we talk about platforms and we focus on uh, often these digital platforms, one of the things that's going on is we used to have a lot of network effects, but the, uh, the proprietorship of the network effects uh, often was public sector. Uh, if you think about money, for example, uh, seigniorage has been in existence and talked about for many centuries. Uh, it's traditionally a government thing. Uh, when we look at modern payment instrument markets, uh, that's kind of been privatized. And how does that work out? And is it OK? And is it a good thing? Um, if you think about uh, ride sharing, which David talked about earlier, um, back when I was a, a youngster, uh, there were ride sharing boards in student unions and other such places. Um, nobody charged for that. Uh, maybe they monetized it by getting customers into the student union, but I don't really think so, actually. So it was just a thing that people did. Um, it wasn't a business. And I think, obviously, you can think of counterexamples, but I think there is a tendency for the innovative uh, IT-based, data-based platforms to do things that always had network effects, uh, but used to have those be public property rather than uh, the core of a business. And that's an interesting set of questions. Um, I also think, as a pragmatic matter, we tend to use the word platform more if the management of these complementarities is most of what you do rather than part of what you do. So the less of other stuff you do, the more apt you are to get called a platform. Um, and I think uh, the popularity, let's say, among um, enthusiastic young MBAs of the platform business model idea is going to contribute to more and more people wanting to purify the business, get rid of the dirty business of, of making stuff, uh, and focus on the business of managing your network of distributors and suppliers and so on, which is more platformy. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. <coughs> um, so what in terms of competition policy and antitrust? Uh, 
Well, I think, uh, you know, back to the uh, old network effects uh, uh, issues, uh, it's a form of economies of scale. That's not an antitrust problem in itself, but it does set things up for antitrust problems. Uh, there often are vertical restraints, uh, most favored nation clauses and similar. Um, there's sometimes non-neutrality of the relationship with complementers where some people might expect or want neutrality. Is that a problem? Can be, not necessarily. Uh, and then there are all the issues which I know Catherine talked about, uh, about uh, diving in a little deeper to what are the entry barriers, what are the entry channels that you can, can get around those barriers, multi-homing, switching costs, who is the installed base you care about, and so on. Another issue that really gets to, uh, as I say, the management of the complementarities rather than the reduced form that we used to look at in network effects is the pricing pattern. People are very interested in this. Um, and the neutralization results when you have a transaction between the two sides sometimes. I think basically you can say there is neutralization provided that the transaction price is not trying also to do some other work or otherwise constrained, uh, as it is, for example, in um, payment systems if you have price coherence uh, and uh, in other contexts, perhaps for other reasons. Um, so where does this leave us in terms of antitrust policy? I think one place it leaves us is economists are uh, professionally not very practiced at saying, yeah, don't look at everything. We're, we're more inclined to say, yes, look at everything, because everything might be interesting and could be relevant, and, uh, and it's cool. And so uh, I think for practical policy, we have to find, and this I think relates to some of the things Mark was saying, uh, we have to find ways to say, yeah, there are platform issues here, but they're not particularly important. Or yes, there are platform issues here, and they are particularly important. And doing that dividing line, of course, like any dividing line, is apt to be arbitrary. Uh, but I also think that uh, the more we get excited about these issues and the more we talk to and listen to people who are excited about these issues, uh, the more we're going to see it everywhere. And uh, that's not necessarily going to help with the most intelligent uh, strategies for looking hard at these issues in some cases and seriously backburnering them. Uh, in other cases. I think that's perhaps the challenge because um, I think courts and antitrust practitioners and consumer protection practitioners uh, like to have rules that say you've got to consider this here and not there. Um, and I don't think that's a natural way for economists to, uh, to function. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there that's going to be, going, going to be it already is, uh, a challenge. Thank you. Well, I'll try to help Howard out by saying some things that are wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, I think, unique on this panel in that um, I, uh, I have not written what's viewed as being one of the really important articles on two sides. And then, and then talk more generally. So um, it's perhaps the most fundamental principle in uh, economics that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And uh, so uh, probably a lot of people in this room have these, uh, have these credit cards with very generous rewards. And we really uh, like getting those rewards. Uh, but, uh, but someone is paying for those rewards and it's useful to think about who's paying for them. Now, if the people getting generous rewards with their American Express cards were the people paying for, for those rewards, then, uh, you know, th th then, then there wouldn't uh, you know, probably be any problem with it. Uh, but, uh, but, the, but the reality is that the 
uh, that the, the way the credit card system is set up is that the, the, uh, the, the big merchant discount that's being, uh, uh, that's being used to pay for the rewards is, um, is being paid for not by the American Express customers, but by all the customers of the merchants who, uh, who are taking the American Express card. And um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's as if the, the cattle farmers, uh, the cattle ranchers of this country got a law passed that said any restaurant that serves steak dinners has to charge the same for steak dinners as it charges for chicken dinners or pasta dinners. And let's assume for the sake of argument that it's cheaper for the restaurant to buy pasta and chicken than it is for, to buy steak. I think we would all agree that if someone goes to a restaurant and they want a steak dinner and they're willing to pay the extra cost of the steak, they should buy the steak dinner. Um, but that it doesn't make much sense to have the people who choose to get pasta and chicken dinners pay for the extra cost of the steak dinner. Uh, so that's, that's the outcome um, that, that, that we have. And it seems to me that that's uh, it's pretty obviously an economically inefficient outcome. And it's also pretty obviously an an it's anti-competitive to make someone else's customers pay for the cost of your service. Um, so, um, so market definition is supposed to help us get to the right answer. Uh, and what the Supreme Court did in the Amex case was that they used the theory of two-sided markets to get to, uh, to, to, to uh, what I think is, is the wrong answer. Um, so, you know, and that's not to deny the point that when you look at the merchant discount, uh, you, you, know, you, you need to also consider the fact that there, uh, that there are incentives on the other side of the system. You need to take that into account. Uh, but that could, be, uh, that could be done at the, at the, second, or th at the second stage of the, uh, of the rule of reason uh, inquiry. And, um, you know, which is a point that, that Justice Breyer made uh, in his dissent. So, um, uh, you know, so I think the MX case uh, is an example that should make us cautious about whether or not uh, the advances in the economics literature are going to be used in a way that, that, that leads to better outcomes. Uh, and, um, and there are, you know, ways in, um, in which um, in which the um, what the court said about two-sided markets is, um, uh, if you were to apply it too generally, would just plainly be wrong. So, um, so one point, one general point about two-sided businesses, and it's important to distinguish between two-sided businesses and two-sided markets, which is a, a point I think Mark was making which is that um, for, 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 for most two-sided businesses, there's competition on both sides of the business. And to analyze the competitive effects, you need to, uh, to, to analyze that competition separately. Uh, and so the court was, of course, was careful to distinguish between what it called transactions markets and, um, and, and other two-sided businesses. But if you look at, uh, say, advertising-supported platforms, they're they're competing for, uh, for, for viewers uh, or readers or whatever it is. Uh, and they're competing against uh, other businesses that may or may not um, have, uh, may or may not have two-sided business models. Uh, and they're competing uh, for advertisers where the advertisers might be looking at, uh, at you know, much different kinds of, um, uh, of of ways of advertising. So, um, you know, so, so what are the, you know, I think that the big pitfalls um, that need to be avoided with respect to citing the, the two-sided uh, markets? Um, you know, so, so, you know, so, so the first one is this point about market definition. Um, and then, um, you know, it's crucial not, not to limit 
uh, or not to assume that, uh, that the competition faced by a business with a two-sided platform is primarily with other businesses that have similar strategies. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, so, you know, an example is a merger the FTC uh, reviewed a couple years ago between Truly and Zillow. They had very different, you know, they had two-sided two business platforms. Uh, they had very similar business models, right? But they were compete, but, you know, they were competing for people looking for houses on one side of the market. They were competing with realtors or to, to get realtors on the other side of the market. And on both sides of the market, they were, they were competing with a much broader set of entities than the companies that, um, that, that had their, um, their particular business model. And then the last, I think, really big pitfall to avoid is to let the, two, the, the two-sidedness of businesses obscure what's really, uh, obscure the, the more important issues. So there's a lot of controversy um, worldwide over how to deal uh, with, uh, with Google. And uh, you know, David made the assertion earlier that Google is, is a three-sided business, uh, not a two-sided business, uh, where the assertion was that, um, th that, uh, that websites that want placement in Google's results are an actual side of the business. And uh, you know, the real issue in you know, looking at the difference between the way the US handled the investigation into Google and the way Europe handled the investigation into, into Google search bias is that the US recognized that the real issue was innovation <coughs> and product design, right? And that's a, that's a real issue whether you're looking at it as a two-side business or, 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 or a one-sided business or a three-sided business. And, you know, and the assertion that it's a three-sided business, then um, you know, I think really obscures it. So I've run out of my time, so I'll stop there. Great, well, like Michael, I have not written a lot about two-sided platforms, but I've written a fair amount about technologically dynamic markets where, into which a number of the platforms that have gotten a lot of attention in the competition policy world would, would seem to fall. So I wanna talk about some uh, some aspects there. And um, unlike Joe, preemption to me is great because I like leisure. Um, so it's, it's a matter of, of, of joy rather than concern. So I'll, I'll skip a few of the points I've been planning to make. And I want to focus on something that I think is very important when we think about the characteristics of platforms and some of the things that Catherine and David uh, have outlined for us uh, along of what you've heard from my fellow panelists this morning. Um, and I think one of the things we need to understand is what do the dynamics of network effects, whether the direct network effects, indirect network effects, whether they're positive or negative externalities, what do they say about the durability of the market position or the market power of these platforms? Because I think ultimately one of the questions that will really drive what kind of policy uh, competition agencies develop for platforms uh, will be affected by how durable those platforms turn, uh, turn out to be, how strong the market power is, not just today, but what it's going to look like going forward. So I want to just uh, step back and talk a little bit about that debate, about the durability of these platforms and how the economic principles and the economic characteristics that we've heard about this morning might affect that in both directions, and sort of talk about what more we need to learn before I think we're ready uh, to decide uh, how concerned we are with the market power of a platform, perceived market power of a platform uh, at any given uh, point, uh, point in time. So I think we can acknowledge that at any given moment, uh, a platform might have very large market position and that large market position might reflect not just share, uh, but market power or even dominance in some lines uh, of commerce. Um, obviously the fact that somebody has large market share may not reflect market power. They may be innovating at every moment, uh, fighting for customers who are at any moment ready to, uh, to defect. So you can, from a large and dominant firm, get very competitive outcomes, but you also often do not. And so what should we make of the fact that uh, a large platform is at a certain moment 
um, uh, apparently dominant uh, in, in a line uh, of commerce. Um, well, some say that we should make rather little of this and that if one looks at recent history, there are numerous examples of apparently powerful and dominant networks or platform products uh, that have quickly uh, eroded uh, as a power in the market. So uh, some would point to Microsoft, at least some of the markets that were at issue, some of the products that were at issue in the Justice Department's uh, investigation into Microsoft and the European Commission's investigation. Others would point to um, uh, the uh, AOL Time Warner merger and the apparent dominance of AOL and in instant messaging. Um, others might point to iTunes, which, you know, at a certain point people said, all right, you know, online music is done for the next century. That turned out not to be so true. So there are a number of examples one can point to of apparently, you know, uh, unassailable monopolies that, that, that vanish rather quickly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people will look at some of the large platforms that are very powerful in various lines of commerce today and say, yeah, there's something very different about those platforms and what they're doing. These platforms are going to last uh, last forever. Uh, and there are certain, at, certain things that have to do with the enormous amount of capital they possess, the strength and breadth of their network effects, both direct network effects of the kind Catherine described in her uh, pr framing presentation where, you know, th the, this network is more valuable to me the more other people on my side of the market who are using it because it's more people I can interact with. I don't want to defect because I'll go to somewhere, uh, to, to somewhere that's, that's, you know, got fewer people perhaps, not as good. Um, and the cross-network effects that allow, for example, um, uh, uh, people on one side of the market to ef effectively subsidize or benefit uh, my product uh, or, you know, the, the service that I, that I consume on the other side of the market or that users consume on the other side of the market. So do those network effects really solidify the market position? Do they create lock-in and switching costs of a kind uh, that create a particularly um, uh, 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 durable uh, monopolies? And certainly there are, there's a lot of argument now that what we're looking at, and one can just find whether it's from the v, certain people in the VC community, whether it's certain firms trying to enter the market, whether it's various commentators um, uh, or people trying to do business with some of these platforms, they will make these arguments. These are dominant firms that are going to last forever. We've got to do something about them. So what's right? What, what should be our view of the likely durability of uh, these kinds of platform monopolies. And I think one can look at some of the very same dynamics that might lead to a platform uh, to rise in market position uh, as being uh, dynamics that could actually reverse. So the very same things that create people to rush to a particular product and then have this reinforcing feedback effect where every new user of the product makes the product more desirable to everybody else so pretty soon you've got everybody on one social network or you've got more data flooding into a particular search algorithm and you get this reinforcing feedback effect that can be very hard to undo. But we've seen examples of where those have in fact un uh, become undone and the untipping or the tipping back or the switching to a new uh, platform uh, can happen rather rapidly. So I think when one thinks about the economics uh, and when one thinks about some of the social dynamics that surround how people decide which platform to use, one can tell, I think, a pretty coherent economic story based on some of the characteristics we've heard about today. Well, even a fairly large and dominant appearing platform today could unravel and tip towards some other kind of product or platform uh, down the road. And I was fascinated by Catherine's story about making Bitcoin uncool at MIT. Um, but there, there, there's a, there is a lesson there. Uh, those of us with children between 15 and 25 may have noticed that their Facebook pages today are places that are sort of acceptable for parents and others to look at. But there are other channels through which they actually interact <laughs> with their peers in ways that they would like their parents and others to know less about. Um, 
And you know, David talked about multi-homing. Uh, we do see a lot of multi-homing activity. And multi-homing activity, if you will, gets right to the switching cost problems that uh, would usually lock in a dominant share for a network. So I think it is a reasonable question, even for certain, although not all perhaps, of the large platforms that are out there, are some of the very things that lead to the fast rise and apparent large share uh, uh, factors that combined with the social factors that I think are very prevalent in these markets be the undoing of these platforms and over what, um, uh, over what time frame. So I think that there, I think the answer is not obvious, and I do think that there is more economic learning that can be done. What were the characteristics of those large, apparently dominant platform uh, products and services that did lose their market position? Why did they lose the market position? And what's different about any given platform one chooses to look at today when we're thinking about um, uh, how to do competition enforcement with regard to those, to those platforms. I would just submit that the answer is not obvious. Uh, I don't think we can presume from the few anecdotes, or I mean, you know, maybe that's a little bit derisive to call them anecdotes, from a few recent historical episodes that any platform that is out there today is vulnerable and may have actually fleeting market power. And in 10 years from now, we'll be turning around and saying, Emma, what? You know, I don't think we can presume that, but nor do I think we can assume from the current market power that we're seeing today why uh, that, 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 that power will, will, will necessarily endure. I just want to conclude with a, a, a sort of a statement or, or a thought about why this matters. If you look at footnote seven of the recent Ohio against Amex decision, it's rather interesting because what the court says is <clears throat> when it comes to vertical conduct, cases. The plaintiff has an obligation to define a market. Well, why do you have to define a market in a vertical conduct case? We presume harm less readily in the vertical context than in the horizontal context. Why would you have to prove a market? Because you have to delineate the zone of commerce in which you are trying to show harm. You are trying to show market power because market power is connected to a harm uh, to the market. So the market power of these platforms is going to be a very important thing. And one thing we don't want to do is take too static a view of market power. If we're going to take a dynamic view of market power so that we make intelligent enforcement decisions, we need to understand better how durable or not these platforms are in their momentary or you know, at any point in time market power. And from history and from retrospective studies, we have to try to identify what are the economic factors that would weigh for and against durability for any given platform. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Katya, Joe, Michael, and Howard. Uh, I want to take this time now to um, turn it over to David and Catherine to see if they have any follow-ups or, or comments after uh, our speakers. So, so, so my understanding is uh, we, we each have, what, about 90 seconds, something like that? No, you have plenty of time. Oh, plenty of time. Okay. Well, so I'm actually not going to I'm not going to take up much time. I just want to um, make just a couple of remarks. So let me begin with Mark. Um, so so I, I agree that that um, network effects are on a continuum, and and there are different degrees of two sidedness and so forth. And I also agree that um, that um, being a platform can sometimes be a choice for firms. But, but I like to temper that um, a little bit um, with two observations. W one is that there is a wide class of businesses that is studied in the literature where it is pretty darn certain that those are significant platform businesses. And we shouldn't get lost in a debate about, you know, is Coca-Cola and whatever a platform business and, and, and ignore the fact that we have this whole set of businesses where it is clear that they are platform businesses. We have a big literature that studies them as offered insights and, and so forth. Um, the other point is in terms of um, deciding on um, being a platform as a strategy, that's sometimes, that's sometimes true. Um, but what's also true is there is a wide class of situations 
in which if you want to deal with the market problem, you probably have to operate as a platform business. Um, so if you want to be um, in the selling advertising business, you better be in the business of getting advertisers and users. If you want to be in the general purpose payment systems business, you better have merchants and consumers, and the list goes on and on and on. There are a lot of situations where you basically need to be a platform. There are situations, and the, the retail situation where you could be a marketplace or a reseller, you can have Amazon Classic or Amazon Marketplace. That is true. That's a business strategy. But it shouldn't um, get us away from the point that in a lot of cases, you really don't have a choice if you want to solve the problem. And then the third point that is related to that is that I think one of the interesting things about the platform businesses that are very, very successful now, and I think Joe touched on this, is that a lot of the very successful platform businesses today, whether it's Google Search or whether it's Uber um, and so forth, are basically displacing other <laughs> platform businesses. They're just doing them in a more uh, creative way, and that's true for a lot of the online media um, businesses as well. Uh, Joe mentioned the, the free um, uh, ride boards. I remember at Chicago, when I needed to get back from uh, Chicago to, to, to Boston, there was actually a business that charged money. And it was a broker between, um, between drivers and people that wanted a lift, and you paid for the, uh, you paid for the service. And that, that's Chicago. At Berkeley, it was a, it was a <laughs> utility in the student union. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many things are, uh, are uh, free and socialized in Berkeley. This is, this is true. The, let me turn to um, just one other point just, just very quickly. And this gets to um, um, Howard and Catherine's point um, concerning network effects and market power and so forth. So let me first of all uh, say, uh, in terms of everything that Catherine said about, about, um, um, about density and operating small platforms and, and so forth. I absolutely positively agree with that. I just want to temper that a little bit um, to say that as a, as a practical matter, um, we do need to worry about the intersection between these local network effects and the fixed cost of operating a platform nationally and globally. Uh, if I want to compete with Uber, um, I can't really just have a Uber business in Boston or just an Uber business in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I need to have a, a bigger business in Massachusetts, and I probably need to have a national business and maybe a global business um, to keep, compete in that space. This still means that in order to build up the business, I need to get a density of drivers and passengers in each local area, but I'm probably not going to be successful if I'm just a teeny weeny um, um, business. So, so um, there is the possibility of entry and so forth, but, but you know, it is possible to, uh, um, to have some economies in which, uh, through the interaction of these things, you do need to be um, pretty big. You know, nothing wrong with that, but you, you may need to be pretty big. Um, I agree absolutely with um, um, Howard's point um, concerning the durability of these, um, um, of these platforms. Um, I don't think, I agree with Howard, that we, we can't look at the uh, failure of some platforms and read into that that all existing platforms um, could fail as well, but it, but it should also make us very um, careful about assuming that just because someone is successful now, they will be um, in the future. And you know, um, all the points that Howard raised about, um, well, maybe the current platforms are durable. You know, um, you go back in time, and the same arguments were made about um, uh, previous platforms. That's not to say that some of the platforms today won't be um, durable and may not be. You know, might very well be around for the next. Um, hundred years, but we just need to be um, a little bit cautious of uh, reading too much into um, sort of where things are um, currently. And then the final just quick point on this, you know, the debate about whether, you know, Facebook and Google and Amazon are monopolies and so forth and whether they're going to be durable for a hundred years, you know, it's all interesting. It's, um, you know, great to read in the New York Times and uh, so forth from Tim Wu and so forth. But you know, the practicality is whether they're durable or non-durable, um, when we get to actually cases, um, we're generally facing, in my experience, working for both plaintiffs and agencies and, and defendants, it's generally a narrow case, narrow situation of whether for this particular restraint, um, is there market power that's relevant 
um, to evaluating that particular um, restraint. And the, the big bad monopoly and the um, durability and fragility point um, is often you know, not all that relevant to dealing with the particular restraint that we have before us and have to evaluate whether it's anti-competitive or not. <clears throat> All right, so I think I'm going to join. I just got three points to make, and the first is to give you the sort of post-it, uh, the post-it note to what happened about my course on platforms after this Coca-Cola incident, which is that you know I learned very quickly the worst thing you can do as a teacher is have people paying eight thousand dollars to hear you speak and then have a huge unproductive argument about definitions. So the next time I taught the class, I had a lie. I said it's continuum. And we're talking about more platforming. And I was really happy to hear someone as elegantly spoken as Joe use the inelegant phrase, more platforming. But I think it's a very <laughs> helpful phrase. Now, my optimistic note, though, is rather than just being a wimp like me, I think when we're lucky when we're thinking about antitrust, that we're not doing this silly thing of looking at firms and saying that's a platform, that's not a platform. Instead, we're looking at a particular case, a particular set of facts, and saying, are platform issues important here? And I think that's an important distinction, which is going to make it easier to sort of go forward. Uh, the second thing I want to sort of pick up on, and this comes from uh, Michael's discussion regarding the Annex case, which is the reason I introduced this language about tipping and coring, is that when I read analysis of the Amex case, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about these two distinct types of strategies. Network effects come into play when we think generally about tipping and thinking about how to set up a market to balance it to bring users to interact with each other. Coring, which is how we set up rules and regulations about how these parties interact, is something we do to keep people happy on our platform. And it always strikes me that some of the key issues of the Amex case are really about coring, uh, but I see a lot of conflation of those two issues. And you know, if we think about it in terms of coring, then we can ask ourselves, well, do these steering provisions in the case of Amex, do they actually benefit consumers or not? We can actually ask those questions if we allow for this separation. The third thing I just wanted to point out, so agree, I think I agree completely with Howard, um, that when we think about network effects and whether or not they're a barrier, it all comes back to being uh, the, the key question of whether or not there are switching costs. You know, and I, my only sort of temper to what David said, which, you know, completely, you know, completely well said, um, about whether or not network effects can still be a barrier to entry if given that you meet, might need some scale of operations, I can completely agree that perhaps to compete with Uber, you need to be more, more than Boston. But what strikes me is that becomes an argument about economies of scale mm -hmm. rather than one of network effects. Yep. So I think we're probably, mm -hmm. probably in agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, okay. Isn't that a nice point to end on? <laughs> Two economists who agree on something. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David and Catherine. So, can, can I say just yes. one thing? Of course. I have a recommendation for the FTC, the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Um, if there's one thing I think you should do as a result of the platform hearings, it is to ban the phrase more platform. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, let, let's start at the beginning in a way, in terms of the definition. Obviously, we've already opened the Amex case. Um, already, and um, some criticisms, maybe some defenses. So one of the issues that came up is how to define platforms, obviously. And this sort of reminds me of the market definition exercise, where economists, we tend to like to think of, of markets more in a continuum. There's substitutes, but it's the degree of substitution. Whereas in antitrust, we're interested more broadly into sort of zero or one classifications or in or out for various reasons. And there's pros and cons to each approach, but we've settled in on defining relevant markets and allowing us to sort of make assessments within that market. So that comes to the next question of, while there's no canon for market definition and, and there's perhaps a continuum in terms of how 
platform-like or platformy that you are, um, what should we be looking for? Is it we know it when we see it? Is it the strength of the network effect in essence? And that's kind of how we measure it. Um, so those are the kind of the issues that I think uh, implementers, regulators, courts will face is when are we facing a platform and what if it's sort of fluid between the two as sort of Mark has alluded to in terms of continuum and you know, I'm happy for everyone to, to weigh in but I'll start with um, Howard and, and Michael on this question. Yeah, so I, it's just come to my attention as I look down the panel that on this panel of economists, I'm actually the only one who is also a card-carrying lawyer. So um, I want to put that hat on um, in, in addressing something. Now, Catherine, I, I happen to agree with you, and, and David, that both of you indicated to some extent that we're just not going to spend our time in, a, in the context of a particular case worrying about whether it's a platform or more platformy or less platformy. But actually, I think after the Amex case, that's exactly what federal courts are going to be spending a heck of a lot of time doing. Because the, the, the fundamental burden on the plaintiff hinges on whether or not the court decides that we are dealing with a transactional platform with significant cross-network effects. Now, if those things are shown, then the plaintiff has to show a sort of total welfare analysis, if you will, across all uh, sides of the platform. If not, the plaintiff can do what the plaintiff does in every other antitrust case, show harm and flip, it, flip the burden to the defendant to come back and say, but there's an offsetting benefit in all other rule of reason cases. So I do think that this definitional question is going to be overwhelmingly important because we are going to have tons of defendants claiming, I'm really kind of less platformy, and I'm kind of le less network effecty, and I just don't fall into, uh, I mean, you're, you're gonna, I mean, you're gonna have, excuse me, a lot of plaintiffs saying that, you're gonna have defendants coming back saying, oh no, no, I'm, I'm like way platformy, and I've got every cross network effect in the, in the book, and I've got all these different sides of my market, and you've gotta like show harm, you know, net over all of them, plaintiff, see you later. So just the one thing I would say is this is any, I think, guidance on exactly what kind of network effect we're talking about, a cross-network effect, which is to say uh, different people who may benefit differentially from the same, different sides of the market that may benefit differentially from the same policy. Um, I think, and what constitutes a strong network effect are gonna be things that economists and competition agencies should get a jump on before these are defined as a doctrinal matter through an accumulation of court cases that are bound to come. So I just want to say, I think the definitional issue is going to be front and center. Yeah, well, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, if you look at the literature, sort of one approach to the multi-sided market uh, issue is the Potter-Stewart approach, which is that you know it when you see it. Um, and then you have these attempts to define it uh, more rigorously. And you know, David did, I think, as good a job as could be done to try to do it. But uh, in a famous article, Jensen and Meckling said that the essence of a firm is that it's a nexus of contracts. And, um, and, and every firm, I think, is solving the, 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 the four features that, uh, that David uh, you know, that David asserted. I mean, we're sitting here at George Mason University, and um, you know, it, it hires professors and it charges tuition to, to students, and you could imagine a situation in which the students just directly contracted with the professors, but George Mason University is, 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 is minimizing those transaction costs. And, you know, and that's true of one-sided businesses, what we call one-sided businesses is two-sided businesses. Now, that said, I agree with David that there are some businesses out there that are, um, you know, that, that, that clearly look like they're multi-sided platforms. And the essence of them is that they are competing for more than one set of customers in ways where the competition for one customer interacts with competition with the other customers. And so it's important. I mean, the, the purpose of market definition 
is to identify the competitive constraints operating on the firm. And so when a company is competing for more than one set of customers, you need to define the market with respect to both of those sets of customers. Who, who are they competing with for, customer, for a set of customers A, and who are they competing with with a set of customers B? And if, if you don't do that, you're going to miss, uh, you're gonna make bad decisions because you're gonna miss the, um, the competitive environment. Do you mind if I just jump in quickly to, I hope, clarify what Michael was saying? Uh, I think what you said was you need to define the market to include both sets of customers, but then when you kind of explicated your own comment, it sounded as if you were talking about defining two markets, which is a very different thing than lumping them all into one. Um, so uh, I would agree that in market definition, you need to consider both. I hope you were not saying you should lump them all into one, but if you were, then. No, I wasn't. Yeah, thank no, you. You have to define two markets. Yeah. Thank right? you. Well, because for the advert, look, take advertising supported businesses. There's, there's a market for the advertising, there's a market for, for the viewers, and you, know, and, and you, you have to look at those, that, that, that competition uh, um, in, you know, in some sense separately. Uh, did anyone else want to weigh in on this issue? So I, I think, um, I, I, I think the, um, the, the notion that this is really hard I think is um, a bit overblown. So we have, we have now an extensive literature on multi-sided platforms that goes back to 2000. Um, uh, Catherine, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that, that there is massive amounts of consternation in the literature about what exactly a two-sided platform is. People tend to talk about the same businesses and, and, and so forth. So it's, there's not a lot of controversy among economists about what this class of, of uh, businesses is. Um, I take your point, Howard, that you know, some defendants are going to come along and try to claim that they're the most platformiest uh, business <laughs> around. I'm violating my own rule now. Um, and you know, I suppose that's possible. Um, but, but I've been involved in a lot of platform cases. And you know, the economists on both sides more or less agree that they're platforms, and we analyze them. I have a case now where I'm working for an um, agency. It's obvious that it's a platform and, and so forth. I suppose there are going to be cases where, where they're going to be marginal and, and so forth, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are an awful lot of situations where they're, they're simply not marginal. Um, and my guess is when we get into the facts of the case, it's going to be fairly clear um, what a platform business and what a platform business um, isn't. I don't deny that there will be massive numbers of billable hours by lawyers um, you know, wrapped around this definitional question, but I think at the end of the day, I, I really don't think it's going to be as hard as um, Michael is making it out to be, that everything could be two-sided and so forth. So yeah, it, it sounds like we kind of needed like a snip test for how platformy you are. That sounds well, like I've, I think we've identified a real issue for the FTC, which is there are two jobs. One job is, um, as expressed by David, to think about the cases where it's clear that it's platformy and what do you infer from that and how do you handle it? And the other job, uh, which may also be necessary, although it's less congenial to economists, uh, is to focus on the gray area. Um, and you know, perhaps both of those things need to be done, but they're not really the same task. Um, so, Haju and Wright, they state that indirect network, network effects or cross-group effects exist even for non-platforms, and this is sort of getting at a theme that we have arrived at. Take, for instance, Walmart, where if you're a shopper, you care about the variety and the number of manufacturers in which Walmart deals with and stocks on their shelves. In a similar way, manufacturers care about, um, obviously, the number of consumers that attend or uh, shop at Walmart, and that influences their decision, and you can think of Netflix in a similar way, even if in some sense they're not platforms. In what sense? So this sort of gets to my question. Um, how should we think about these indirect network effects? Are they sort of unique to platforms, or are they applicable to single-sided markets in the sense that for a reseller such as Walmart, a manufacturer like Procter & Gamble is essentially handing off their product that tied to Walmart to then sell to consumers, and we wouldn't. I think traditionally think of that as a two-sided platform. In a similar way, is a 
advertisers are handing off their ad to Google, who then decides to serve it for certain search results? Or are they maintaining some control over that that moves it more in the two-sided arena? And so that's sort of broadly my question is, how should we think about these indirect network effects? And is it more about the level of significance in terms of what drives behavior uh, for that business in the sense that recognizing all of them have some degree of this? Um, or is it a little bit more clear and, and cleaner than that? Um, so let's start with, um, I'll throw this out to Katya, Joe, and, and David. So I'll let Katya start. All right, I feel like now I'm all of a sudden in the, in the role of needing to decide whether you're a platform or not, uh, the thing the economist doesn't like to do. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, it's, it's really about the strengths of the network effect. I, I agree with your Walmart example. To some extent, the consumer has a fixed shopping cost, and so they care about the variety they see at the store. But I think fundamentally, Walmart's success to me is about the fact that they have much better logistics than anybody else out there, and that's been able to drive price down, and that's why the consumer comes. Um, so, so I would agree, yes, there's uh, platform notions in many markets, like the retail example, um, and uh, you, you would think that they affect uh, market power to some extent. Uh, but my general thinking is that they are much smaller in those types of settings than in, in a case uh, like Uber, where really the platform is the primary feature of the product market itself. Joe, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's, uh, that's getting awfully um, definitional in a way that I don't find terribly helpful. I mean, uh, so you're pointing to a way in which Walmart is a bit platformy. Um, and as Katya says, maybe that's not really the main thing going on with Walmart. And then, OK, where do you go from there? David, did you have anything yeah, so, to add? So, so let me make a, um, just a practical observation um, on this, which kind of goes back to the, to the previous discussion. So, so there is now an extensive literature within two-sided platform economics on ad-supported media. It goes back to the mid-2000s. As I said before, lots of theory papers, lots of empirical papers. I don't think there's any real dispute in, in, in the profession that ad-supported media uh, consists of two-sided um, two platforms. So there's this whole body of literature with lots of interesting insights. Uh, including on mergers that one can um, rely on. Um, there is not a vast, uh, I'm not sure there is any um, uh, literature uh, talking about supermarkets as being um, two-sided or simple retailers as being uh, two-sided. Maybe there are some papers out there, but I don't, I don't think so. So practically, if you're involved in cases and someone says, and it's an ad-supported media case, you can rely on the literature and a body of, of theoretical empirical research to support the notion that yes, this is a two-sided platform business and you need to worry about it. If a defendant comes along and says, my supermarket is a two-sided platform business, see, well, um, you can certainly, they can certainly make that argument, but the hurdle is higher because you don't really have a body of economic literature um, to, really, um, to really support that. It still might be two-sided in some cases. I just want to add a little salacious background to oh, that salacious, article, salacious background to that, that article, um, which is that the origins of it is that when uh, Andre was at HBS, his colleagues didn't believe that platforms were a big deal. Now, I've got a little bit of MIT pride relating this story, but they said that we just don't think that these two-sided platforms are that big a deal. And as a result, this article came out trying to sort of translate indirect network effects to sort of more traditional businesses. And I think if you sort of understand it in that context of someone trying to say this could be a deal somewhere out of where we usually think about it, it makes a lot more sense. But I don't think we should go to that article and say, ooh, indirect network effects are everywhere. We can't define it. Andre was just trying to say, look, people who've always worked you know, with really large multinationals, uh, what I'm working on, the sort of Google, Facebook stuff, isn't 
as obscure and as uh, niche as you might think. Are you saying that the management at HBS didn't think Google was a big deal? <laughs> That is the salacious implication of what I am saying, yes. They said it wasn't a big enough industry to work on if you wanted tenure at HBS. So I want to turn to Roche and Tarol and um, the model that they developed and other pioneers in terms of the profit maximization of a two-sided platform. And as David alluded to sort of the difference between price levels and price structure and how uh, Roche and Tirol, in some ways, define platforms based on that structure, and Catherine had some comments on that. Um, so in, in some ways, where does this fundamental interrelationship between the two sides and prices lead us? Is this sort of our avenue into a definitional approach? And I don't mean, I know there's some aversion to that, but in terms of just from a practitioner's perspective, is this something that could help a court or practitioner unlock what is or isn't a platform and the strength of that? Um, and so I wanted to ask that in a related audience question, what specific economic tests can be done to evaluate market power in a market that is claimed to be two-sided? Does it, that allow us to unlock some tests on market power as well? So I'll dark, direct this at, at Mark, but obviously everyone can address this. Uh, well, I'm going to say after hearing this discussion on both sides of me, I do feel still justified in bringing up my earlier point about platforminess and, and, and how important it is. Of course, that, just to, I'll jump into your question in a minute, but just to reply to David, um, you know, of course I agree, some businesses are just clearly platform businesses, no one could deny it. Um, although I think many of them have features of their business, even those firms have features where we could probably ignore the, the, the platforminess. And also, I guess, a bit of salaciousness. Um, I, I went to a talk at the BU Law School last, last week, and the speaker had the view that already there's been defendants filing, you know, we need to start this case over, we're a transaction platform. And, you know, may maybe as David suggests, it'll turn out to be just a lot of billable hours that are very easy for the court to decide, but I, I do think Howard's point that this is coming is, uh, is a good one. I don't have any, it's salacious because I don't have any specific cases to mention, just was kind of just rumor at this uh, presentation, so. Um, turning to uh, John's question about, um, um, Market power, I think, it, you know, in evaluating market power, for me, the, the thing that we always have to start with that often I feel like doesn't get started with is really specifying the counterfactual. That is, you know, we can take the learner index and rewrite it so now it accounts for cross-side network effects or, or something like that. But inherently, the learner index is, compare, is thinking about price compared to marginal cost. And, you know, what is our counterfactual when we do that? In a traditional case, we're thinking about perfect competition, which might force price equal to marginal cost, or socially optimal pricing, you know, what the omniscient social planner would pick, which would be price equal to marginal cost. And neither of those are the case in two-sided markets. In two-sided markets, we often don't want price equal to marginal cost. And it's not clear that competition would move price towards marginal cost, or um, on, let's say, two different sides simultaneously. And it's not always clear that competition moves price to be in even an efficient direction. You know, I mean, and we can compare, you know, we can compare the market with a single monopolist to a market with millions of competing platforms, and you know, that would break up the network effect and dissipate the sort of demand side economies of scale that we're talking about. And that, that makes it much more difficult to um, evaluate, you know, what, what we mean by, um, by, uh, by market power. Um, and, and I think that's, e even in the theory literature, as much as we have, you know, I, I, think we, I think we could still have more just kind of pinning down exactly what we're talking about in that dimension. All right, Joe. Uh, well, I have a slogan on, on market power that I will uh, haul out, although there's also going to be a separate panel on market definition and market power in platforms later, so I'm preempting the panel, including myself. Um, uh, I think some writers on writing say you can improve the clarity of your writing by getting rid of abstract nouns and substituting active verbs, and I like to do that when it comes to market power. Uh, so I think the right way to diagnose market power is to say if something harmful were done or attempted, and maybe you specify what that something is, who would do what? What would happen? Would users on this side of the market flee in droves? In that case, what would happen? Uh, 
is there enough single homing and switching costs that that wouldn't happen? In that case, what would happen? Uh, so I think if, if you um, up the active verbs and downplay the abstract nouns, uh, you do a lot better. I've noticed that that doesn't necessarily direct your attention to share in a defined market, but that's the way it goes. So some have suggested that platforms in this interrelationship between prices is very similar to complementary goods. And so we're making much ado about nothing. And there was some flavor of that. I'm not suggesting this was their entire argument in the dissent in American Express uh, of the case in terms of invoking complementary goods. So I want to direct this at Catherine. So what are the important views in I, between two-sided platforms and complementary products? And David hinted at some, but I wanted to see if you had any thoughts. Yeah, so no, I really like the way that David was saying it, and maybe if I would paraphrase it, he would say, look, uh, if you have complementary goods, you make money from getting people in your market and keeping on selling to them, whereas in a two-sided platform, you make money by bringing two separate groups together. When you say that, they sound like very different things. You know, maybe if you sort of like something more concrete, let's think about a coffee maker, something like Keurig, right? If you, you know, sort of the Nespresso to make you American coffee. Um, now, that is what I would generally think of as a complementary good. Why? Well, you make money by getting people to put the coffee makers on their kitchen countertops and they keep on buying these expensive little K-cups to put in them. Now, of course, you could make that into a platform if you didn't decide to be the supplier of the coffee pots. If you just said, here's a technology standard, go on, make coffee pods, whoever wants to, then that could be potentially, uh, it's not a technology platform, but it is a product platform. Um, but it's quite, you know, it's quite a very different business to get into when you're gonna have a very different strategy towards it. Well, I think um, when you write down the models, mathematically, they look very similar. Um, that when you, if, if, you're, if you're selling complementary goods and you um, lower the price of good A, you take account of the fact that it will stimulate the demand for good B that you'll get a margin on, and that, you know, that affects what you're doing. And that's very similar to the network effects where if you take David's example of singles bars, if I lower the price for drinks to women, you know, that'll in increase the, um, the, the drinks I'm gonna sell to men. Uh, you know, with, with the tire and car example, or, uh, tire and gasoline, I guess you used. Um, you know, David said, well, you'd have different people, different companies selling the tires and the gasoline, but if it was the same companies selling the tires and the gasoline, then they would take account of those cross effects, and mathematically, it would look very similar to um, uh, you know, to, to, to these um, to these two sided effects. I mean, I agree with Michael, but there, there is sort of a there, there's a bit of a conceptual difference, and I'm not sure in the end how much it matters. But the universe of things covered by, for example, Amex, much greater than complementary goods. And you know, we are, we're used to thinking of complementary goods as things that are in some degree, to some proportion, used together, whether it's K-cups and curd coffee machines or things that might have much more variable pr proportions. When you are talking about cross-network effects, you don't need to have that concept of a complementary good involved. What you have to think about is things that might be where one good is contingent upon the way some other good or service is provided. So what happened in Amex was people like their Amex card because they like their points, presumably. Um, those points are funded by the higher fees that the merchants are paying, and if you let the merchants steer, that flow of fees would be cut and the downward flow of points would be cut. So in some sense, the downward flow of points was contingent on the upward flow of fees, but the consumer isn't thinking that. Right? These are not necessarily visible. They're not part of some kind of combined consumption decisions. I'm thinking about, you know, for example, you know, Kodak copiers and paper. The Supreme Court has told us that rational consumers think ahead about how they're consuming both of these. I guess we could tell a story where a rational consumer thinks, if I don't use my Amex card and I use my, 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 my cheaper 
MasterCard, well, wait a minute, I have two long run effects. I will benefit the mass by perhaps reducing the costs of the merchant and lowering prices for everybody. But by using my higher price card for the merchant, I directly individually benefit by these higher flow points. Maybe you get that kind of thing. But I don't think consumers are thinking about these, what I would call, you know, contingent or enabling goods the way they think about complementary goods. Yeah, just in response to, to, to Michael. Um, okay, so mathematically there are similarities and whatever, but I mean, so what? I mean, um, the two-sided models that we're all talking about are focused on different customer groups with indirect network effects. We have a literature now that has all sorts of interesting implications that we don't really have in the <coughs> older literature on complementary goods. We have an extensive empirical literature that's relevant to a wide set of businesses. There's been a massive payoff um, from the two-sided models. So, so what if in the background there's some similarity with complementary goods? I don't really see what the relevance um, of, it, of it is. Um, the, 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 the point about uh, or criticism that two-sided platforms is just complementary goods. Um, I think my first paper in the area in 2002 addressed this. I think many of the papers in the area over the years have addressed the point, no, it's not just complementary goods. And what I, I have to say I find frustrating in this area is that you know, 17, 18 years later after the launch of this area, after these things were discussed back in the early 2000s, you know, we're sitting here among economists having discussions about, isn't it just complementary goods? And we have a Supreme Court decision and an economist presenting briefs, you know, suggesting that it's just complementary goods. It's not just complementary goods. You have this massive literature published in prestigious journals um, with all sorts of interesting insights. It's not just complementary goods. So let's, let's stay on Amex. We're going to stay here a while, but we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on at some point. This might be it. Um, so 18 years I was at the commission as an economist. I spent most of that trying to think not about the law per se and focus on the economics, take competitive effects, weighing both sides, who has the burden. That was a, not interesting to me. Maybe it should have been. But now um, focusing here on the law school and learning where such prima facie, word I've never said previously, and getting that right. So one of the big issues in Amex on the legal side, and maybe, again, this might not interest us as much, but I think it's relevant to, to practitioners, is who bears the burden of showing the benefits and harm? So example, for rule of reason, there's a three-step process, and usually the plaintiff needs to show that anti-competitive harm, and then the defendant can then subsequently show that pro-competitive benefit, and then the policymaker and step three makes some weighing of those two. So s focusing on step one, this was the Amex case, what is anti-competitive harm? Is it the net sort of welfare of the two groups, which is where, where the majority came? Or is it what, what sort of the, the dissent said is that, let's not bundle these things to, together, let's keep them as a two-step process. Um, so it gets fundamentally at what anti-competitive harm is or isn't. And so let me start with um, Howard, and then we'll, we'll go to David, and if anyone else wants to weigh in, we'll go there. Uh, so I'll add that John was the last 12-year-old economist who got hired at BE. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think what I would say is, you know, and, and in your, you know, your 18 years of, 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 of being at the commission, John, you certainly saw lots of different kinds of alleged harm, you know, in conduct cases. And the interesting thing to me about the Amex case is it didn't do a lot to narrow down what could be a candidate theory of harm, right? It, it really was about what um, sort of what scope of harms a plaintiff had to bring to bear. And so, you know, we don't really know at the end of the day what the court thought of the theory of harm that the merchants might have been alleging. One can think of a, no, of, of, of a number of them. So what I would simply say is, I think any of the harms that have been recognized by the precedent could be brought to bear where relevant or where provable on a side of the market. 
the key thing about Amex is it's saying that once we have flipped you into this bucket of a transactional platform with significant cross-network effects, you've also got to have an, a strong theory of harm or at least of not offsetting benefit from, uh, from the other sides of the market. So I think, I think any sort of, of these theories of harms, although I will note something rather interesting. Um, you know, if you think about the merchants, they could articulate a theory of harm that is, we have to remit these higher fees to Amex. Okay, but I mean, there's a lot of pass, there is, those are being passed through effectively. So what is the harm that's occurring? Well, it's we have to, we don't know if somebody coming into our store is gonna use an Amex or a MasterCard. We can't have different prices depending on what card you're giving, you know, you're gonna pull out at the register. So we're just raising prices, um, you know, at least to the average level of the card fees, but maybe even, you know, higher. Um, and so you're raising prices to consumers. There could be a standing issue there. There could be a competition issue there. Th those will all be fleshed out, I think, in future cases. So if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about rule of reason cases, um, and if we're talking about a situation in which you have identified a two-sided platform with um, significant indirect network effects, so I'm assuming all that, um, then the thing we know is that the um, two sides are linked, there are positive feedbacks going on, and the welfare of the two sides are linked. Um, also, if it is the kind of platform where they're probably competing with other platforms mainly, which was the case in, in Amex, the, the competition is taking place over both of those customer groups is taking place um, simultaneously. Um, in a situation like that, if we're interested ultimately in determining whether there is a um, harm to the competitive process, the competition that's taking place between the platforms is over both sets of those customers. It's hard to see why we wouldn't want to take both sets of customers uh, into account in terms of determining whether the restraint is a harm to the, the competitive process. Um, we, we often use um, prices and output and quality as signals of um, whether there has been a harm to the competitive process. Um, um, uh, in a rule of reason case, again, with those kind of two-sided platforms, um, hard to see how you could establish harm by just looking at one side for a lot of the reasons we've um, we've already um, discussed. Both groups of customers are, are relevant. They're both being competed for. Um, if there really is a restraint, um, you would expect that in the counterfactual world, um, that restraint would show itself with the um, overall price level uh, being raised, so an exercise of uh, market power, and we'd expect that in the counterfactual world, um, the restraint would be generating, um, um, uh, generating less output. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, it does seem to me that uh, you'd want to take both groups into account um, in, that, um, in that context. Well, you'd want to take more than those two groups into account because they're externalities on the other, uh, on the other customers. Um, but, but, but no, Michael, I mean, if you're taking a, a traditional approach to market definition, um, if that other group of customers in, isn't defined in the market, I'm not exactly sure how you get to um, to do that. No, I, well, I'm agreeing with you that you can't just look at the price increase to the merchants and infer market power from that. And you have to take account of the fact that if there are rewards on the other side, that um, you know that those rewards might be shifting the demand curve out for the Amex card holders in a way that 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 compensates the, um, the, the merchant for, for, for the higher fee. But, but you can't just look at the net price either. You need to, I, mean, I think this is Howard's point, which is that, 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 that because of the no steering uh, condition, and even if you got rid of the no steering condition, there'd be this price coherence issue, that um, that, that fee is being, uh, is being borne partially by the, the people who pay with other cards. And you, know, and you have to take that account in, in, with respect to what's competitive harm. Mm 
just a couple of just a couple of quick points on this. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether you actually do get to do that. Um, there may be a market failure issue you might want to talk about, but in an antitrust context, I'm not actually sure whether you get get to do that outside of the market that's been defined. But I mean, that, that's above my pay grade, so maybe that's a question for the lawyers. The, the one thing I did want to uh, get to, uh, j just say briefly, John, um, with regard to your question on the burden shifting. Um, so, you know, one way you could approach this is you could you could do one side in, in the first stage and then, you know, look at the other group of customers um, in the um, pro-competitive efficiency stage. I think that's the wrong, the wrong approach. But one thing I want to mention is it's very interesting in Justice Breyer's um, dissent. Um, he says, yes, so, so remember, th this is actually an issue as to whether, given that the cardholders were in a different market, whether you could count those efficiencies right. at all. Um, the Justice Department in their brief said, well, we think you should be able to count them. And Justice Breyer agreed with that. But with an with interesting qualification. Uh, his qualification was, of course, in practice, um, uh, defendants never succeed in doing that. So um, I'm going to move on from Amex. I feel some groans from the audience whenever I mention Amex. So we're going to kind of move on. And so. But I will get to Michael and Mark, who uh, I had one more question for them, and, and I'll, I'll incorporate them in this following um, question. So let's move on to multi-homing and switching costs. Just to give you a little bit of context and background, maybe to generate discussion, in a Pew survey earlier this year, Facebook was used by 68% um, of all US adults, uh, which placed it as number two. Number one was YouTube at 73%. Now, you're probably thinking, wait, is that really a competitive Facebook? Certainly on a differentiated space, they might be quite far apart, but uh, certainly a social media. And others were Instagram at 35%, Pinterest at 29%, Snapchat at 27 LinkedIn at 25 Twitter at 24 and WhatsApp at 22 According to Pew, most the median adult uses three of the eight platforms in which they surveyed. For example, 74% visit Facebook. And the intensity is also high. 74% visit Facebook daily. But those who use Snapchat, it's close behind with 63%. So it's fairly clear the evidence is strong, not just in social media, uh, but in other areas that there's some intensity of multi-homing. There's actually a story. Just yesterday, I was um, with uh, a friend of my daughter's, and she took a picture, and she said, can I post this on Instagram? She's in fourth grade. And she pulls out a phone that's literally larger than her face. And I said, oh, uh, sure. You can, do you have an account? Are you going to use her parents? She said, no, I have an Instagram. I said, how about Facebook? She said, no, no, nobody uses Facebook. That's, that's uncool. Getting at the Catherine uncool part. <laughs> um, so what do we make of the fact? Let's just fix ideas, and we can use any type of multi-homing example. But almost data shows almost everyone goes to Yahoo to some degree in terms of checking news and various things. They might not search there, but they go on Yahoo. Certainly, Google, we all know people use Google a lot. So they're multi-homing on both, and the data shows that they're often on both. But they seem to be skipping over the search box on Yahoo and just doing it on Google. Is this a case of two lemonade stands next to each other, and they just go to the one with the better lemonade? And it's a little unfortunate, but it's not market power per se, or a lack of choice. It's just a lack of intensity of use. So how should we consider switching costs and multi-homing in the context of an antitrust investigation. If data shows a lot of people are using social networks outside of Facebook, what are the arguments sort of pro and, and, and against enforcement based on that? So I'll throw this to Katya and Michael and Mark, but uh, anyone can weigh in. So I, I have a 10-year-old daughter. She does not have a phone, <laughs> but I understand from her friends that the reason why they use it, Instagram is because it has a private feature that fa Facebook does not. So I think that might be why. But uh, Speaking to your broader question, I think the um, challenge in using these statistics on multi-homing is uh, usually I think the way we think about competitive interaction between products and how strongly they compete is we think about, well, you know, if one product raised its price, how many consumers would it lose relative to uh, people abandoning altogether or something like a diversion ratio. Uh, with something uh, with two-sided markets, that's sometimes difficult, especially with the examples you mentioned, because the consumer doesn't really pay a price, and so we can't observe in the data 
sort of this um, idea of uh, responsiveness on the, uh, on the consumer's part. And so instead then we have these um, multi-homing statistics and I think they are indicative of uh, switching costs in examples like the one that Catherine put up, which is the, the um, Uber Lyft example. These are platforms that um, offer, I think, very much more similar products than, for example, the Yahoo Google example you uh, put at the end. And so they're seeing people uh, multi-home and being active. Ideally, that would be the second thing I think you'd like to see, not just that they have it installed, but that they also use it. I think that would give you some indication of um, switching costs being uh, insufficient to, to prevent uh, to people from being locked into a platform. I'm less certain that uh, seeing people use both Google and, and Yahoo would tell me um, as much about the competitive intensity between those platforms, simply because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, they offer differentiated services, and it might well be that I use Yahoo only for finance, but use Google for all of my searching. And so I think they are just observing multi-homing, in a sense, isn't sufficient uh, to really say much about the competitive interaction. Michael? Well, the, if multi-homing is easy, I think that's a, um, pretty clearly a limit on, on the extent of market power. I mean, whether it, it, you know, that by itself proves anything uh, isn't so clear. But the Yahoo example is a really good example. And, and I mean, I think, Kat, you, you're right that you know, if you look at Yahoo, as I understand it, there, there are two areas where, where Yahoo's been very successful, and that's with finance and with sports. And people have learned that, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that they're good at that. And Google has a finance product, and uh, people in the room might disagree with this, but uh, you know, I've never liked it that much. Um, and you know, what the example illustrates is that, is that the, the competition in, you know, with this group of products occurs on a a class of search by class of search basis, and 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 the competition to get financial information is not limited to uh, to, to Google and Yahoo, but it would also include the Wall Street Journal site and and, and other sources of financial information. Mark, did you have any thoughts? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I agree with um, what we just heard. Um, you know, as a kind of matter of, of efficiency, you know, in these kind of net network effect markets or competing platforms, you only need one side to multi-home to kind of get efficiency in the sense that everyone can reach each other, right? If, we, if our main goal is that, you know, everybody can reach every everyone on the other side, only one side needs to multi-home to achieve that. And in that sense, you know, kind of one side multi-homing seems like it would do enough. But then it turns out that if one side is multi-homing and one side is single-homing, that has all these really extreme predictions for pricing and the nature of market power, and that's kind of this literature that, that David's been referring to is, you know, exploring exploring a, a lot of that. And so I, I tend to agree with what actually Catherine said it in her initial remarks and what we just heard, that if people if we are multi-homing on both sides, um, that tends tend to be a limit on competition. I, I don't think that's been actually established in, in a theoretical paper in the way that we might like, but I, I, my, I'm guessing that's probably true. There is an issue of, you know, what John referred to as switching costs. You know, if everyone's going to be multi-homing, there's probably paying a cost to holding multiple, um, you know, holding multiple apps or systems. And um, uh, I think that's probably a, a cost as well. And sort of balancing that against the competition effects of having single homing on one side, you know, might be challenging in any given context. Joe? Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to remind people, and I think some of the other speakers have said this, but not quite this bluntly. I mean, both single homing and multi homing are simplifications of a nuanced reality. So just because you single home doesn't mean that you would never switch. And just because you multi home doesn't mean that you would switch for Epsilon. Um, it's, uh, it's a matter of degree. If you're multi homing, uh, you're probably more likely to switch with less inducement. Um, one area where this uh, um, came up was in the early years of telecom competition after um, uh, entry started happening. 
Uh, and there you saw that um, uh, households tended to single home and businesses sometimes multi-homed. Um, there, of course, if you want to call someone, you might say if they're not already multi-homing, good luck with it. Otherwise, you have to send a, a messenger boy around on a bicycle to say, would you mind getting a, a second <coughs> phone so that I can ring you up? Uh, and that's probably not going to happen. So that might be a little more hardcore. Mm -hmm. But in general, it's a nuanced thing. And talking about single homing and multi-homing is kind of simplifying and stripping that down. Mm -hmm. Just on a related question is the role of defaults, and that plays a role in the Android decision uh, at the EC, where Google preloaded their, um, their suite of apps, and that was considered perhaps something that didn't in help competition um, in that area, uh, although perhaps it gets at the core of their monetization. Um, it's an, an issue that came up in the Google search case as well, and the Google makes it the default on various uh, browsers, certainly their own Chrome browser. Um, and it came up in Microsoft with Netscape. But we're certainly at a different age in terms of the switching costs from a default. Given that the default, um, often it doesn't take a lot of actual time to switch from a default. How should that play into our analysis? Is, is, that, is it ultimately too simple to think of default uh, purely as, as sort of can you do it or not? Or does it really inform us in terms of the level of market power that these firms can have? And I'll just throw this out if anyone wants to take it. If not, we can just move on. I mean, I'll just say a, a quick word about that. I mean, I find it hard to think about uh, the question of defaults totally separately from the question of interoperability. And um, you know, I think defaults are, are fine. I don't think there should be any rule against defaults. I mean, people actually want the simplicity of you know, signing up for a service and having not having to select everything and do the brain twisting exercise of deciding which setting is best for them. The, these platforms know something about what are going to be the most desirable settings for most people. So I think I, I at least as a fairly lazy person when it comes to these technology things appreciate the defaults until they start to bug me. And then what I want is two things. Options, that's where interoperability come in and ease of switching. And the problem with Microsoft was there were options, but at least early on, and what they got caught with in court was that the ease of switching was not easy, that they had done things to defeat switching. So I think putting aside that kind of conduct where it's simply a question of the consumer deciding to go to a menu or do what everybody does now, just Google, how do I get rid of that you know, weird thing that keeps defaulting on my screen, and you're sometimes told I can't, then that's not a default problem to me. That's an interoperability problem. And other times you're told, do A, B, and C, it takes you 14 seconds. So to me, the interesting question, and I don't know how much this is an economic question as opposed to a question for behavioralists of different types, is 14 or 44 or, or three minutes of, you know, 44 seconds or three minutes, is that a meaningful barrier or not? What I have observed, um, at least is, you know, with my students, is they are more than happy to go through the challenge of downloading an app, in which takes you know maybe you know a minute or less, and to figure out very quickly how that app works as a way around something or to do something we're doing interactively in the classroom. You know, I think it's an empirical question and a behavioral question, but I, I don't think that the mere fact that some people like me are too lazy to do that for long periods of time should necessarily be viewed as a significant competitive issue if it is easy and if the options are there through interoperability. Okay, so let's um, move to something related to an audience question. I'll read the audience question and uh, have a little lead up. How do you evaluate a market with two dominant competitors, but many smaller competitors? So we hear a lot about the potential difficulties entering to markets that have strong network effects, both direct and indirect. We can sprinkle in arguments about big data, also creating certain barriers to entry, although Catherine and Leslie had a paper on that that I thought was pretty insightful. If you haven't, um, if you haven't looked at that issue, that's a paper to start at. Uh, Bruno Julian wrote, it may be easier than expected for a superior technology to enter provided that the quality of improvement is large enough. So within network effects, can it work sort of both ways? 
Um, one example that, that David gave uh, for the blah, blah car, which I actually thought he made it up. I thought it was, oh, he's just hypothetical world, and then it's a real thing, where they limited the number of drivers on the network because it was more about the quality or type of driver that they wanted rather than sort of the numeric size of a network, which is sort of getting outside of sort of perhaps breathless assertions about some of these networks. Uh, similar with Open Table, it wasn't about getting a lot of restaurants on, it was about the right restaurants and the right uh, consumers, and that's a, an example David also uses. So what characteristics of digital platforms hinder entry and what might actually facilitate entry are winner-take-all stories supported by the empirical realities? And is it significantly easier to enter and be profitable? Is the minimum viable scale a term that we've sort of gotten rid of in the 2010 guidelines? Unfortunately, I kind of like that, but I'm dating myself by referencing that term for the guidelines. Um, is it easier in a digital platform than, let's say, mac and cheese? where you know, for my daughters to get the mac and cheese, it seems to be just two brands, Kraft and Annie's. I don't know, maybe, I just view it as hard to bring a mac and cheese to the market. Maybe I'm overstating that. Um, <laughs> but just, those are just some thoughts to, to get us started. And, and Catherine and Joe, I'll, I'll throw it out to you guys first. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just start. So maybe I'll just skip and I've, I'm allowed, I'm gonna have a little publicity for my paper with Leslie. So, this is a paper we've actually never managed to publish because we didn't find anything. And the reason we, what we were doing when we didn't find anything was we were looking to see how some changes in European regulation about how much data you have stored about search results, whether it affected the quality of search results. And we measured that by something called a bounce back rate, whether it, that is someone had to search again, refine their search. And we found absolutely no change, whether you had six months of data, three months of data, nine months of data. Um, and you know, it was one of those O oh moments. We presented it, I think, actually here. And all these engineers just mocked us for this result. And they said, it's very obvious. Don't you know how many searches are unique and how current they are? And you don't understand anything about search advertising if you think that data six months old is at all valuable. Um, so I felt thoroughly mocked, never been able to publish the paper, very glad that someone like John likes like it, it <laughs> which is very, you know, it, it's time has come. Um, anyway, so my big point, I'm going to pick up sort of just the, the question of why, why do we see, you know, all the examples of solid limits to multi-homing we've heard about have all been about devices, whether it be Joe having two telephones in your house, which seems such a, you know, weird idea, whether it be sort of Microsoft and thinking about uh, switching costs which come from an operating system embedded in a piece of hardware. And now in this digital age, we really are sweating a bit to try and understand the, where the switching costs are coming from. And I'm going to actually pick up John's point, which is, well, we've got two brands of mac and cheese. And there's a whole marketing literature uh, huge marketing literature, I have to point to, which studies this precise question. And this is called uh, switching costs that just come from brand inertia. Most brands, if you think what a brand is actually doing for you, it's just a proxy to not think. And so when you buy those mac and cheeses, it's really about you just using the brand so you don't have to think about it. And this is like something a bit uneasy for economists. We don't like to think, the consumers don't like to think. But perhaps it's a way forward to try and understand some of the inertia we see in these markets. <clears throat> so um, let me give a very different answer to the, uh, or response to the question, maybe not answer. Um, I think the Julian paper, I haven't come back uh, in the last few days and looked at it, but my memory of it from a while ago, uh, is that it's in the tradition of looking at the circumstances in which an entrant with proprietary network effects that are strong enough to lead to market dominance will displace an incumbent with such strong network effects. In other words, in a battle to the death, who's going to win? And there it's really all about the dynamics of expectations and uh, who wins the winner take all and, and takes all. So I don't think that actually gets to the question from the audience, which was about the role of small competitors in what looks like a heavily networky or platformy 
uh, type of industry. I think there I would want to ask um, why have they survived? Um, perhaps they get to specific communities of um, interactions that don't particularly want to be in on it with everybody else. Perhaps they offer something else instead. Um, given the reasons that they survive, why have they stayed small? Um, possible similar uh, answers. But I think in evaluating the level of competition, which I think is what the question was referring to, uh, when you look at small firms, and this is a broader thing, it's not all about uh, platforms and network effects, um, you want to ask, you know, why do, why do they stay small? Do they stay small? Are they expanding? Uh, why do they survive? Um, what's going on there? Okay, thank you. Um, so let me go to an audience question. So this is an audience Amex question, so it's not coming from me. Um, an issue that was discussed was whether credit cards are especially two-sided due to the fact that every transaction involves a consumer and a merchant. Um, and that something like a newspaper is something different. This is that transaction versus non-transaction distinction. And I, I was just wondering if the panel had any thoughts on whether that is useful going forward in terms of defining markets, and does that introduce a different set of tools, or is it a, a distinction that's important, but it doesn't change the fundamental reality of how we should assess a uh, platform? Um, maybe start with David, and if anyone, or you don't have to comment, but. So, 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 so the question is on um, transaction platforms versus ad-supported platforms. Um, so um, f first of all, I think there are more similarities between transaction platforms as um, that term is used in the Phyllis Rucci paper and ad-supported platforms than some people think about. Um, um, uh, but, 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 but let me put that aside. I have a paper coming out on that that um, I, can, um, I, can, um, I can send along. But they're both obviously two-sided platforms. Um, there are indirect network effects, these, the same pricing things, and, and so forth. So I would be inclined to use kind of generally the same, uh, the same general framework. Um, I think the, the issue that's raised with the ad-supported platform versus the transaction platforms is um, you know, how you go about um, defining markets and contours of competition and, and, um, and, um, and so forth. And, you know, the MX case, you know, decided to define a single platform market. Um, I, I would at least admit the possibility that there are going to be cases where it may be very sensible and the more convenient thing to do to define um, one market on one side and one market on the other side and then deal with the um, welfare linkages by, by um, linking those two together and taking both of those markets into account. Ad-supported plat ad platforms may be a, a case for some of the reasons that Michael um, talked about. Ad-supported platforms also compete with single-sided content platforms like Netflix that don't do advertising and you know, doing a single platform market is a little bit complicated in that case. So, so there's an argument that in that situation, Maybe you should have separate markets and define it that way and then take the linkages um, into account. I think as we do more of these cases, we'll get more experience um, in how we want to go about doing that. But the fundamental economics of ad-supported platforms and transaction platforms are um, the same. They're both connecting two distinct groups of customers. They're both internalizing an externality. Um, um, and they both have some form of network effects. And the other thing for ad-supported platforms is the, the advertiser, the, the consumer may, like, may not like advertising, uh, but they do like content. And in order to get the content, um, you need to have advertisers willing to pay for the content, and that generates a positive feedback loop between the um, advertising side and the user side. So a lot of similarities there, but you know, there may be reasons in particular cases to analyze them separately. Okay, so we have basically a minute left for each panelist if they want to take it on sort of where the areas of platform research need to go and some areas that need to be explored further. And let me just close by saying thank you to the FTC and the GME for an amazing setup for time, timekeepers with the most lovely stop talking signs I've ever seen. <laughs> it's 
This is awesome. I wish it was always like this. So let me start at the very end. We'll go down the line um, if you have thoughts on this. Uh, Howard? Um, you know, just, just a couple of things. I do think we need to do a better job of integrating some of the behavioral economics literature or, er, you know, literature from areas of economics like marketing that have always been more inherently behavioral if we're really going to understand, um, you know, how consumers are going to behave in these markets and if we're going to understand what I, you know, what I still think is a very, going to be a very important issue in a lot of these particularly conduct cases, which is, how do we think about market power um, and how do we think about the, the uh, fragility or durability of that market power over time? I think those are, those are topics that are worthy for research. Full disclosure, I'm about to write a paper with Bill Rogerson on monopoly durability, so. <laughs> well, this will feel like it's coming out of the blue, but you know, in the we talk about the two-sided markets as if the markets are separate, but before you get the two-sided markets, um, you have to have separate products. And <coughs> I think with a lot of these businesses, the, the, the question of how you do the separate products test is something that's really been unexplored in, in, in the literature. It was a big issue in Microsoft, but there's not, you know, there's not a literature on exactly how to do it. I think we should figure out how to do it. <coughs> Uh, where does the field go in one minute or less? I'm tongue-tied, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I sort of agree. The one thing I would add, though, is, uh, you know, I'm an empirical economist, and I think one thing that's been amazing about uh, seeing some of these tech platforms come up is we just observe a lot more about consumers and firms than we did before. And so that might actually allow us to speak to whether consumers are, are responding behaviorally in ways that our models don't typically allow for. And so trying to dig more into how we can assess competitiveness and, and uh, the use of the importance of multi-homing with some of these data, I think, seems, seems quite valuable. So I'm also an empirical economist, but I'm going to pick two things I wish the theorists would, would, would do or do for me, because I can't quite figure it out myself. Um, one is that, you know, we talk a lot about the effect of competition in, among platforms, but I don't think there's any theoretic, theoretical models that I know consider one platform or two. And there's no papers with more than two. And so I think if we're going to talk about competition, you know, richer, richer models of what competition means would be really useful. We got that question, what if there's two big ones and lots of little ones? We, I don't think we have a, a theory model. I mean, you can maybe, you can extrapolate from one, going from one to two but I think there could be more there. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, network effects are uh, run counter to market efficiency by themselves. I mean, they're, they, they're something that outside of what we, if we're gonna describe an efficient market, or sort of a perfectly competitive efficient market, it's not gonna have network effects. It's some kind of, I don't wanna say market friction. Um, but what that means is that every, you know, we may say inefficiencies in markets with network effects, but that doesn't mean it's an antitrust violation. Maybe, you know, it's, it's an inefficiency that's not due to some anti-competitive behavior, and maybe that points us towards regulation or something like that, which is not exactly the FTC's business, but um, I think more direction about exactly what is the antitrust violation and what's kind of an inefficiency that just arises un un underlying the, the kind of technological feature of the network effect would be uh, helpful for me. You know, I'd go back to that speech we listened to from the commissioner this morning. I thought it was like a really wonderful blueprint for what we should be doing. He sort of laid out all these big questions uh, that exist, such as trying to understand when uh, marketplaces own regulations are pro-competitive or whether they're anti-competitive, such as trying to understand, well, where does data play into all of this discussion. I know that's what we're doing in November, but it seems strange to be having this conversation <coughs> without thinking about data. And also asking, you know, how does consumer behavior change in these purely digital markets? I thought those were all great questions, so I'm, I'm gonna give all him the credit rather than trying to come up with something new. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to the opposite end of the oh. spectrum. <laughs> So in, I, I think all these, all these big grand questions I think are really interesting, but I think the, um, in terms of the FTC and DOJ going forward and analyzing platform cases and everyone else analyzing platform cases, 
Um, I think we need to be careful about um, doing things at a general level and thinking that we're um, learning things. I think um, uh, platforms are an incredibly diverse set of businesses. We heard all this discussion of multi-homing and so forth, but I mean, the reality is when we get into cases, it's Joe's point, you need active verbs. Um, to what extent is the actual substitution? To what extent is data in the particular context of the particular case and restraint and so forth that you have before you is, is relevant? So um, I, I think that an awful lot of these questions um, you're not really going to know the answer to until you deal with the facts of particular kinds of platform businesses and until you actually do the empirical research that's applicable to the questions um, but before you, and I worry a little bit that um, um, these kind of grand um, themes, uh, people will say, oh, multi-homing, therefore there's a lot of competition. Well, you know, it depends on the degree of substitution in the particular case that's actually uh, before you. And I think that's true for data and pretty much everything else. Please join me in thanking David, Catherine, uh, Mark, Katya, Michael, and Howard.